Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo Podcast. February marks Black History Month, and we are devoting this episode to the contributions of African Americans to the Alamo's history. Today, we reveal the real stories behind these figures who so often are shrouded in myth or forgotten by history. We'll also tackle the tough truths behind their presence at the Alamo and explore how Alamo grounds have become a central backdrop in the local fight for civil rights. I'm your host, Emily Balkum. We're joined by Dr. Charles Gentry. He's a historic preservation specialist with the city of San Antonio, as well as a lecturer in the African American Studies program at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Also with us is the Alamo senior curator, historian, and lecturer, Ernesto Rodriguez. Thank you both for being on the podcast. Thanks for having us, Emily. Thank you for having us. You both serve on the Museum Planning Committee for the future Alamo Visitor Center and Museum, scheduled to open in 2027. What are your roles on the committee? So the Alamo established a museum planning committee and exhibit uh, subcommittees that will oversee the refinement of the interpretive plan that will guide the stories and exhibits within the visitor center and museum. And I've had the honor and privilege of being invited to serve on a subcommittee with a number of other historians. And we are planning multiple galleries that will help to tell the full 300-year history of the site focusing on the diverse people who lived in San Antonio and around the Alamo through various historical periods throughout this creation process. We've been advising staff and consultants on content and methods for gathering community input as it relates to the narrative and the exhibits. Fascinating, Dr. Gentry. And Ernesto, what's your role? I'm one of the leads on the uh, planning committee and in the historians committee. And we're taking everything that is uh, coming in from different sources and then basically formatting it into a more reasonable method that we can then disperse to the general public. Let's start with the Texas Revolution era. What was the demographic makeup, the size of the black population here during that time? Take us inside their world. When we lead up to that moment, we have to look at the transition from the Spanish colonial era to the era of Mexican independence and then the struggle for Texas independence uh, in the earliest census that the uh, Spanish took in the San Antonio area, we accounted for maybe uh, 151 out of 260 persons who were described as de color quebrado or, or uh, of a burnt color. And so we might identify those as people of, of African descent. People of African descent uh, were here since the earliest days of the uh, arrival of the Canary Islanders in 1718 and intermixed and intermingled with the local population, the Spanish colonial settlers. But when we get into the 1820s, 1830s, we start to see the importation of more enslaved populations. And uh, we estimate that around the time of uh, Texas independence, there were probably around 150 free black people. Uh, there were probably some 5,000 slaves uh, in the area in the uh, year of Texas independence, 1836. Uh, and that number grows exponentially over the following years and, and decades leading up to the Civil War. So during the Texas Revolution, some were enslaved and others were free. Walk us through what their lives would have been like on both sides of that. So we have evidence of a number of different free black people in the area. They may have had different paths to freedom along the way. Uh, some may have bought their own freedom out of uh, chattel slavery. Some may have been manumitted uh, by their owners. Others may have escaped. Uh, and then others might have been immigrants uh, to the area. What role did slavery play in the Texas Revolution? We know that uh, the abolition of slavery in Mexico after the uh, independence from Spain was a very contentious issue. The first attempt to abolish slavery in uh, the Mexican state was by uh, Vicente Guerrero, who was the president of Mexico, and he issued a proclamation in 1829 that attempted uh, to outlaw slavery throughout Mexico. He was the first president of uh, partial African ancestry from uh, the uh, fight for uh, Mexican independence from Spain. He, he participated in that fight, but he was ousted by 1829 or in 1829 by the conservative government and was executed in 1831. The protests uh, from Texas also succeeded in undermining 
that attempt to uh, abolish slavery uh, by securing a, a specific ex exemption for the region. There was also a uh, Mexican decree in uh, April of 1830 where the, this new law sought to outlaw further uh, American immigration into Texas. And so this all uh, you know, was wrapped up in debates about slavery in Mexico during the 1820s and became entangled in larger disputes over federalism and centralism during the 1830s. Uh, and that shaped the course of the path to revolution uh, for Texas. Ernesto, would you say this was the only issue in the Texas Revolution, or were there more? There's a, there's a lot of issues in the Texas Revolution, and it's one of those things that, um, like Dr. Gentry said, Mexico had already made concessions. And so if you get what you want in this concession, are you fighting for that, or are you fighting for other things? And the majority of the fight is states' rights, and it's, it's the civil war in Mexico. And it erupts in Mexico, and the one that helps lead it on early on is Valentin Gomez Farias, the vice president of Mexico, who starts basically a campaign of going to town to town, spreading the word that what has happened with the centralization of the government is not the right form. They were a republic, and now they're a centralized authority, and revolution breaks out. So it's a civil war, and it's Mexico City is hit, the Yucatan is hit, Zacatecas is hit, Coahuila and Texas are hit. It just so happens that in Texas, we evolve and it turns into an independence movement instead of part staying with the status quo. Thank you both for helping put this important topic of slavery in its proper context. Some people today say we need to look at this through a 21st century lens. Others say it's unfair to apply 21st century thinking to 19th century actions. How do you navigate this conversation to find a balanced understanding? Uh, well, as historians, uh, we have to be objective and look at the available evidence and evaluate it and uh, interpret it uh, based on uh, what's actually there. Uh, now, history has many uses. <laughs> so those who might say that it was primarily about slavery may have their purposes. Those who say slavery wasn't you know, an issue at all may have their purposes. Um, I think that I'm grateful for, to the Alamo for having the courage to, to take on this issue. Uh, and to uh, tackle it head on. And I also appreciate the fact that uh, they invited Dr. Carrie Lattimore a couple of years ago to host a uh, webinar on slavery in Texas, Mexico, and the U.S. And I, I encourage people to, to find it. You can watch it on YouTube. It is uh, you know, fascinating. He brings up during the webinar that someone raised the question, well, why are we talking about slavery, what does that have to do with the Alamo? And it's a, it's a legitimate question. It's uh, uh, fair and, and uh, interesting and, and worth diving deeper into. And, and what Dr. Lattimore says in response is that, well, you know, there can be a third way. Um, and his, you know, third way is to say, okay, well, it can be one of the issues and, and there can be more. You know, there's the old adage, if we don't uh, learn history, then we're doomed to repeat it, right? So, you know, that adage tells us that there is something uh, worthwhile in looking back and learning from it as we uh, look in the present and try to make uh, judgments and, and try to uh, you know, make decisions moving forward. Honing in on the Battle of the Alamo, tell us about Joe, William Barrett Travis's slave. He uh, was a historian of record for what happened during the Battle of the Alamo. He was a survivor, um, but he was also uh, enslaved uh, to William Barrett Travis, uh, and he had an, uh, an interesting history, a couple of attempts to escape uh, enslavement prior to becoming uh, the property of William Barrett Travis. Also, there is some uh, belief that he was the brother of an escaped slave and prominent abolitionist uh, by the name of William Wells Brown. So it's uh, an interesting uh, dichotomy of, of uh, life pathways and, and outcomes for these two. Uh, but uh, after the battle was over, and uh, William Barrett Travis uh, did not survive. Uh, Joe uh, was found by the, the Mexican army and forced to identify uh, key members of the garrison uh, after the attack. He then uh, is sent to Gonzales. He catches up with Susanna Dickinson. They uh, report to uh, those in Gonzales about uh, the incident, uh, what happens there at the Battle of the Alamo. And uh, after the uh, war for independence is over, he does not get to uh, enjoy you know, his liberty. He actually remains a slave and is hired out 
uh, to earn money for the Travis estate. Uh, the, the widow and the, the family uh, have to be provided for, so the executor of uh, the Travis estate hires him out to earn money uh, for the family. And about a, a year after the revolution, he uh, makes his escape on the uh, anniversary of uh, the Battle of San Jacinto. He uh, runs away, and the uh, executor of the estate uh, puts an ad in the paper uh, that lets us know that he had uh, made his way with a horse and uh, had an, a companion, a Mexican companion who also had a horse, uh, and there was a reward that was offered for their capture and return. For the Travis family, he was never caught or returned to to the best of our knowledge. In some uh, cases, people think that he may have made his way back to uh, Alabama, where he had been before. Uh, other cases, some uh, rumors say that he was seen in Texas in, in later years. Because of Joe, we really have a better understanding of what happened at the Battle of the Alamo. Was he the only African-American person there? Uh, no, there's uh, evidence of uh, a number of other individuals who were there at the Alamo. Uh, uh, in addition to Joe, uh, Joe's own account refers to an unnamed woman uh, that was uh, lying dead on the ground in between two rifles. Uh, we don't really know her status, whether she was uh, a free black woman or an enslaved black woman, since she remained unnamed. There is a woman by the name of uh, Betty, who was a, a cook uh, in San Antonio and uh, was invited to come into the garrison to cook for the, the men, and uh, she was uh, a survivor. Uh, there's a, a man who is referred to as Charlie, uh, who is uh, perhaps a friend of Betty's. Uh, it's unclear exactly what his uh, status was as well. He could have been someone associated with Jim Bowie. Uh, we're not you know, absolutely sure about his status. And then uh, there are also other accounts that make references to uh, individuals named Sam and John, who, again, we don't want to speculate too much about you know, what their status was or who they may have been associated with. Uh, but uh, beyond that documentation uh, that's named by Joe, there you know, are, are other uh, references without much clear evidence of who was actually there during the siege. There are reports that the first person wounded in the Texas Revolution was Samuel McCullough, a free black soldier in the Matagorda Volunteer Company. That's right. Uh, he uh, travels from Matagorda to Victoria and then to, to Goliad. He was uh, an enlisted member of uh, Captain James Collingsworth's company. And uh, on October 9th, 1835, uh, he and 47 members of the company marched on the Mexican garrison in Goliad, where 100 troops were stationed. And he was wounded in the shoulder, and, and he's believed to be uh, the first casualty of the war for Texas independence. He was the child of a white man. He uh, had never been a slave, but because his mother was black, he was considered to be a free black man. And uh, he married, and his wife was actually the daughter of a white colonist who uh, came to Texas, Sam McCullough Sr., came to Texas with Stephen F. Austin. Uh, and according to the laws, he, after independence, his wife could stay in Texas, uh, but he could not. Um, so he had to send a petition to the Texas Congress asking to be allowed to remain in the Republic with his wife and children. And Congress did permit him to stay since he was uh, one, among one of the first to uh, shed blood in the war. Emily Morgan is often referred to as the Yellow Rose of Texas. She is a legendary figure from this period. Could you tell us her true story and clarify some of the myths surrounding her? Uh, well, to start with, her name is actually Emily D. West. Uh, we do uh, know this because uh, she, while presumed to be a slave of uh, Colonel James Morgan, uh, she was actually a free woman under contract to work with him. They had entered into a contract in uh, New York for her to do some uh, housekeeping for him in exchange for $100 and her passage to Texas. When she arrived, it was in the thick of it, and so she actually ends up in the, uh, the Mexican army camp after the attack at uh, Washington. And uh, she remained in Texas until uh, early 1837, 
uh, when she received a, a passport uh, to return to New York, as, as the evidence may show. But um, she's also associated with uh, this idea of being the Yellow Rose of Texas, according to some 20th century myth makers, and it was based on a journal that had been uh, written in 1842 uh, by a man, uh, uh, an Englishman by the name of William Bollert. On what evidence, we're not sure, said that uh, you know a mulatta girl named Emily, belonging to Colonel Morgan, uh, was closeted in the tent with General Santa Ana, and, and, and that uh, speculation gets turned into the myth of her being somehow involved uh, with uh, distracting uh, General Santa Ana, and then because of the popularity of a song uh, called The Yellow Rose of Texas in uh, the 1950s that also gets uh, wrapped up into the myth, uh, we don't really have time to get into the history of the song, The Yellow Rose of Texas. That takes us back into the 1850s and blackface minstrelsy and how this song is the most popular of a group of uh, minstrel tunes that were about different state roses. Uh, but by the time we get to uh, the 1950s, there have been a number of different renditions of The Yellow Rose of Texas it was, uh, I guess, an opportunist, uh, opportunistic moment to associate it with the myth of uh, Emily West, uh, also known as Emily Morgan. <laughs> and let's talk about a man named Hendrick Arnold. His story is not as well known as others, but he participated in several battles in the Texas Revolution. That's right. Yeah, he was uh, born in, in Kentucky, but actually served as uh, one of three of the guides at the Siege of Bihar and served with both uh, Colonel B.R. Milam and uh, then for uh, Colonel uh, F.W. Johnson. Uh, he was a volunteer in one of the two divisions of about 300 men uh, and, and served as a scout for Colonel Francis Johnson. Uh, his knowledge of the San Antonio area uh, was a, a real benefit uh, for uh, this work. And when he returned from a hunting trip, he was uh, leading a group of men against the, the Mexican army, which was uh, three times the size of the volunteer group. Uh, and um, they were able to actually infiltrate uh, the Mexican army's position uh, in San Antonio. And they were able to uh, advance on the enemy and... Uh, he actually was uh, also uh, present at the uh, Battle of San Jacinto, where he served under the command of his father-in-law, uh, Erasmus Def Smith, who was a well-respected Army scout, uh, and they were spies for the Texas Army at the Battle of San Jacinto. He uh, was given land for his service after uh, Texas independence, and uh, it was somewhere near Bandera. He stayed on that land uh, with his wife, uh, even though... Free blacks were ordered to leave. He was able to also be granted opportunity to stay. And we believe that he operated a grist mill uh, there in San Antonio, somewhere close to Mission San Juan. Uh, and he's buried in the, the Medina Ranch Cemetery, uh, which is now a historic Texas cemetery. And there's now a, a new park along the San Antonio River that's dedicated to Hendrick Arnold. And in 2022, the Alamo placed statues of both Emily Morgan and Hendrick Arnold in Cavalry Courtyard. Ernesto, I'm sure you were there for that. They were made by Eddie Dixon, a black sculptor from Lubbock. Yes, it, it, it was a very, very important moment because we are trying to tell a full story. And in order to do so, you need to be able to have images of diverse group of people because that's what it is. You know, we are a tapestry and like all history is mixed. And so we need to make sure that in order to be able to tell the story and to be able to weave this tapestry, you have to have every fiber in it or else you'll have gaps and it won't hold. How have the black people who were present during the Battle of the Alamo and in the Texas Revolution been depicted over time in books and movies? You mentioned the song, The Yellow Rose of Texas. Since I've been working uh, with the planning committee, uh, I'm a have a deep interest in film history as well. And so I, I, it gave me an opportunity to take a look at, uh, you know, some of both the, the actual films themselves about the Alamo, and then also what uh, has been written by other film historians. Uh, and so I've taken a particular interest recently in uh, a 1915 film, uh, The Martyrs of the Alamo, or The Birth of Texas, which was uh, written and directed by uh, W. Christie Cabane, uh, which is based on a novel 
Um, and D.W. Griffith served as a supervisor in this film, followed uh, Griffith's uh, famous or infamous, if you will, uh, Birth of a Nation. And so, uh, you know, it was interesting for me to see how there were some comparisons uh, between those films. Uh, one was about the Civil War and is, uh, again, infamous for its derogatory depiction of African Americans. And so I was wondering uh, what those depictions would be like. And I knew from some of the research that I read that uh, there were some objections to the way in which the uh, Mexican uh, army was, was portrayed, and there were comparisons between those depictions and the African-American depictions in Birth of a Nation. And so when I finally uh, watched the film, I was actually surprised to see that, you know, while there is, you know, one black character who is not actually a black actor, it's a white actor and black face, uh, he doesn't actually match the stereotypes that you typically see uh, or, or associate with the film of D.W. Griffith and, you know, Birth of a Nation, uh, he actually, you know, has a, um, a very active role to play. He actually walks across uh, Travis's uh, line in the sand <laughs> uh, alongside uh, Jim Bowie. And he, uh, in the scene where Jim Bowie is uh, attacked and, and killed, um, he's very actively loading rifles and handing rifles to Bowie, which Bowie doesn't use because, of course, he's got his handy knife there. Uh, but, um, you know, he, he um, has a very active role to play, which, uh, you know, surprised me. And, uh, you know, I'm curious about some of the source material that was used for that film and, and its depiction and, and to compare it to some of the other uh, depictions in, in other films. You know, another one that I'm particularly interested in uh, was... Uh, was believed lost for uh, quite some time, the Alamo Shrine of Texas uh, by H.W. Keir, who was a, a local San Antonio filmmaker. And one of the interesting uh, things about him is that he goes on to work in the 1940s with a number of black independent filmmakers to make what were known as race films. And so, you know, there's there are these uh, really interesting connections that I'm uh, starting to tease out and really uh, having a lot of fun uh, looking back at, at that film history. As we talked about earlier, you both are on the committee planning the future Alamo Visitor Center and Museum. How do you envision it will foster new conversation and perspectives about these historical figures? I think that what we're doing now, setting the groundwork, and when we finish this project, it will actually help people to ask more questions. Because the thing that you want from a museum is for someone to leave with a question in their mind because that prompts more research. And that's what we're hoping to do. And if we can just get our, our guests to be able to come through and learn something that they haven't learned about any individual or any time period, any event, and then leave here and want to look deeper, we've accomplished our goal. Uh, just to piggyback on what Ernesto just said, uh, I think that considering uh, this site as the Shrine of Liberty raises some very deep uh, and complex questions about the meaning of freedom, you know, freedom for whom, under what conditions, at what cost. Uh, and so we can look at the Alamo uh, as more than just a battleground site, I think, after this work is done. Um, hopefully the call to remember the Alamo will have even greater meaning for people and will encourage visitors to contemplate and reflect on the ways we remember. The museum will also include a civil rights exhibit showcasing Alamo Plaza as a modern day site for free speech and desegregation. What makes this exhibit so important? Well, uh, the Woolworth Building in Alamo Plaza is a civil rights landmark of national significance. It, it was the site of the first peaceful and voluntary integration of a Woolworth's lunch counter uh, in the South on March 16th, 1960. It has been listed as a contributing structure on the Alamo Plaza National Register uh, since 1977, has had a city landmark designation, and uh, you know, a number of community activists organized to have it listed as one of Texas's most endangered places uh, in 2016. So to nominate it um, as, uh, as a state in antiquities landmark, uh, its adaptive use now or reuse in the new Alamo Plaza as part of the Alamo Museum uh, master plan is an extremely significant part of this process. Um, it tells us that the struggle for freedom uh, did not end in 1836 uh, at the Alamo or at San Jacinto. Uh, it continued in the decades and centuries that followed 
and Alamo Plaza has persistently been a site for free expression uh, in that struggle from the post-Civil War era with Juneteenth celebrations uh, by the black community uh, all the way up to the mid 20th century civil rights movement and even uh, up to the present day. So one of the, the important moments from that 1960 uh, moment that I love to, to share with people and tell people is that uh, on March 19th, 1960, baseball legend Jackie Robinson uh, was speaking uh, here in town at La Vita and he was quoted in the New York Times uh, cover page article uh, stating that San Antonio's lunch counter desegregation story is a story that should be told all around the world. Uh, and so now that time has finally come uh, to tell the story and to commemorate the progress uh, that was achieved for all Americans in this very location. The Alamo has commissioned new historical research into this era. You mentioned earlier Dr. Carrie Lattimore, the late historian from Trinity University. He wrote a comprehensive report on civil rights in San Antonio from the 1940s to the 1960s. What did he find and what's the impact of his research? Well, he uh, decided to focus on uh, that particular period and he uh, concluded that geography was very important. Uh, San Antonio's uh, location, uh, not you know in the more traditional South, but also not a more traditionally Western city makes it uh, unique and distinctive uh, in its character. Uh, the fact that we also have been a uh, military city where lots of military trainees and, and uh, active duty and veterans have been uh, where they had to have a sense of, of unity and uh, unification uh, had, had a lot to do with uh, some of the progress that was made. He goes on to cite uh, efforts to uh, desegregate the lunch counters, and he talks about efforts to um, have a non-discrimination ordinance, even though it wasn't you know, a, a, a successful initial uh, effort. It was, again, something that was helping to bring the community together and to unify them. The Alamo senior historian and researcher Colby Lanham has studied press coverage of the lunch counter integration in March 1960. Could you share some key findings? So the, the main thing that Colby found out was that the photos that were taken and put out as being from the Woolworth were actually from the Crest. And so that changes our history because for a long time, people assumed that they were the lunch counter photos from Woolworth, when in reality, on, on that day in 1960, many lunch counters desegregated. And it was a big event, right? It made national coverage. What's interesting is there was a lunch counter that desegregated two years earlier, and it was at Sears. Out of all the places, it was a Sears Roebuck that was located off of Soledad Street, the, the new public library or the big public library is located in that spot. And it shows how San Antonio is different. We are a different place. We are a place where the community comes together and looks at the big picture. And when you think about this entire story of the civil rights movement, the Texas Revolution. Well, Texas Revolution was about freedom from Mexico, but freedom for almost everyone doesn't occur until that day in 1960 when equality is served in the form of everyone being able to sit together as a community and enjoy a meal. And so the fact that they had chosen the wrong place was detracting from our story. And since Colby figured that out, he has been able to correct the record. And uh, the University of Texas at San Antonio, through the Institute of Texan Cultures, their special collections went back and corrected the images so that future researchers will get the story correct. Ernesto, not a week goes by where I don't hear you say, the Alamo is for everyone. Could you elaborate on what you mean when you say that? Yes, the Alamo story is a story that belongs to everyone because it's a world story. It's a story that involves so many different groups of people. And if you study the Alamo itself, you will learn something about yourself. Whether you are from San Antonio or you're from Maine or you're from England, this story has a connection because you can relate to it due to the fact that something similar happened in your spot. Now, we just happen to be lucky enough to be at the Alamo. So this story means something, and it, just working here for so long, you get to see 
the emotional impact of the story on all walks of life. And it's really impressive because a little mission in the middle of basically Texas in the Southwest has changed the course of history. And when people come to visit it and they come to learn, that story becomes theirs. And so we are able to say, this is your Alamo. And I stand firmly that it is everyone's Alamo because it is. It's that idea, it builds on that concept of what a community is. And as a UNESCO recognized site, that's what they look for. It built a community and the community continued to grow and it continues to grow today. Now we are a global community and the Alamo still stands firm in the middle of that gigantic population teaching the, the people of what happened here and how to be, form a community. And Dr. Gentry, being a key voice in this discussion about the Alamo's history and future, what does this responsibility mean to you both personally and professionally? Uh, well, first of all, as a San Antonio native, as I mentioned before, it really is an honor and a privilege to be a part of this process of uh, major change and, and, and moving forward. It's um, something that uh, I remember coming to the Alamo as a student and, and doing field trips uh, here. And, you know, it's one of those things that you don't really forget. Uh, but, you know, I also uh, was someone who moved away for college or, and for graduate school and then came back home and gained an even deeper appreciation for my own hometown and uh, tell people, okay, yeah, make sure you go and see it. And, and uh, you you, I think you've discussed this in some of your previous podcasts that that typical response that people have, oh, is that it? You know, it's there in the middle of downtown. So to me, this uh, process, this, uh, you know, it, it really is a, a monumental uh, change and an opportunity for uh, this to become a real world-class museum that will leave people in awe of what they saw, what they learned, what they uh, came to know uh, as a public historian. You know, I do enjoy teaching about uh, the Alamo and the other San Antonio missions and not only our status as a you know, World Heritage Site and, and National Park uh, Center, but also as an example, as Ernesto mentioned, of how to come together and preserve our history and our stories as a community. Dr. Charles Gentry and Ernesto Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining us. A very thoughtful discussion today. Be sure to check out the podcast notes. We've linked to Joe's account of the Battle of the Alamo, as well as information on the statues of Emily Morgan and Hendrick Arnold here on the Alamo grounds. We've also linked to the research papers we discussed about the civil rights movement in the 1960s and Alamo Plaza's role. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. <laughs>